Everybody, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. It's been a while since I've been here to shoot, and uh, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what did I mess up since last time I've I've done a live stream. Uh, how are you guys? Uh, this is a I'm I'm excited because this is a Rocket Lab launch, which is uh, easily my favorite black rocket flying today. Uh, also, one of my my favorite companies to just watch um, and learn from because th they do a really good job of, of presenting and and bringing us along for the ride. Again, if you haven't if you haven't watched, I've, I've done several interviews with their CEO and founder Peter Beck. I think I've done th yeah I've done three interviews now. Each time is just a gold mine of engineering. He is like an engineer through and through and through. So uh, talking to him is just so great. So let's start off like we always do with pretty much every live stream where we're going to go to a little website called everydayastronaut.com. And when you go here, um, you can click on a button that says pre-launch previews. And what this will do is uh, you can look at upcoming launches. We have a team now of people that are helping to put these articles together. They do an awesome job. Thank you so much uh, to the website crew. You guys are kicking butt. And you can uh, you can click on the upcoming mission. And here we go. We get a little rundown on all of the things you need to know about an upcoming mission. So uh let's 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 go through this together so this mission is called well hang on <laughs> i'm skipping ahead what am i doing okay liftoff time as you can tell by the countdown clock above me it's taking off in about 25 minutes they did push back a little bit into their window but they did have a pretty good sized window of um almost two hours or so uh to be able to launch today so they, they push back a half hour they're still they're fueled up though it's sitting on the pad ready to go but um currently it is scheduled for, uh, I don't know, what it's like 25 minutes from now. Just, I don't know, look at your clock and add 25 minutes. <laughs> the name of this mission is Don't Stop Me Now, uh, which is a ride share between three uh, undisclosed payloads for the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO, NASA's um, Alana series of, uh, of payloads, and an RAAF satellite. Uh, now, we should mention right away that the... The name, of course, Don't Stop Me Now, is a tribute to not only to, not really to, to the band Queen necessarily, but more to um, a, a Rocket Lab board member, uh, uh, Scott Stanford Scott Smith, who recently passed away and uh, was a really big fan of Queen. So this is a tribute to him, which I just love. I think that's super cool. So the launch provider for this mission is Rocket Lab, as you can guess. And the again, the customers are the is NRO, NASA, and the Royal Australian Air Force. The rocket is the Electron rocket. That is the only rocket that current that that Rocket Lab is flying. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it here in a second. But it is just honestly one of the most unique, one of the most twenty first century rockets flying. A rethink of so many things, and it's just really, really, really cool that that um, yeah. I, We'll talk about it in a second, but let's let's finish up this. So today, this one is taking off from New Zealand from their um, from Pad A at Launch Complex One. Notice we have to say Pad A now because they're currently working on another pad there at Launch Complex One, and they also have and will be launching really soon. Um, they'll be launching from Wallops, Virginia, as well. So they have two totally different sites, and now they're going on two pads even in New Zealand. So they're they're ramping up to like <laughs> to be able to really have a high cadence. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I mean, this, this company is going to be launching so much, and they obviously have really big things ahead like recovery. So we'll be talking about that in a little bit too. The, um, the payload mass, we don't really know for sure um, all of these things, but they're pretty small. Most of them are small sats or even cube sats, um, as you can tell by the, the M2 Pathfinder and the Andesite. But um, the, the Electron is capable of about 225 kilograms or so, so 
roughly 500 pounds of payload mass. So um, uh, it's probably safe to assume that the NRO payload is fairly, fairly substantial, more than a couple or several kilograms. These satellites are going to low Earth orbit. We don't know the exact uh, destination of all of them. It's again some of it because of the National Reconnaissance Orbit or, or National Reconnaissance uh, <laughs> Office. There we go, <laughs> not orbit. Uh, because of that, we we might not know the exact destination, the final destination. Okay, so will they be attempting to recover the first stage? No, but Rocket Lab is pursuing first stage recovery, and we'll again we'll talk about that more. Uh, where will the first stage of the booster will splash down destructively somewhere downrange? But they they do survive entry and re-entry with the booster. That is something that they have successfully demonstrated several times. Um, and will they be attempting to recover the fairing? Fairing reuse is not a capability of the Electron. Um, for now, it wouldn't surprise me if, like SpaceX, Electron says, you know, or as Rocket Lab says, you know, maybe it's worth trying to recover these fairings. But um, yeah. So this is the 12th flight of the Electron rocket, the second flight for Rocket Lab in 2020. And I think they're coming up, I think they just had about their third year anniversary pretty recently of, of successful orbit. So just absolutely kicking butt, really ramping up pace. If it wasn't for the pandemic, I think uh, they would have probably already launched like several more times this year. So yeah, super, super. I just, I, I really do just love this company. I love what they do. And I love their fresh take on so many things. Uh, and here we, of course, have a, another visual graphic rundown uh, from Jeff Barrett. And this does show you how tall it is. It's only 17 meters tall, so 55 feet tall. It's honestly not that much bigger. Uh, it It's bigger than the landing leg of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy but not by much. Like, you know, a Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy is 70 meters tall, and this is 17. So it's like under 20% as tall as a Falcon 9 and uh, about three times narrower too. So it's it's a very small but powerful little tiny workhorse and very dedicated to these, to these rides. So um, they're doing something super cool. Now, the thing that's cool about the Electron, the things that I like about it, is um, it has three technologies that I think are, are fairly unique, or at least kind of uh, future thinking, I think, or kind of rethinks. There are three big ones, at least, because there's a lot of things. They do a lot of things like commonality of, of engines and, and off-the-shelf parts type of thinking that SpaceX started doing with, with flight computers and stuff. Rocket Lab has a similar philosophy in that. But the three big ones that I think are cool is the, the Electron is entirely carbon fiber, carbon composite. The entire fuselage and tank is carbon composite. So it's extremely lightweight, but that also means that they, you know, it, cryogenic liquid oxygen is not very happy inside of a pure carbon fiber with no liner or anything. So that was a big thing that they had to solve. Uh, they had to solve a lot of things like triboelectrification or how it kind of makes a static charge on ascent as it goes through the atmosphere. Uh, they had to solve just lots of things. And, and, and now it's just already becoming an incredibly reliable vehicle. Um, the other thing that I think is cool is they 3D print their engines. Their engines you can basically pick up with your bare hands. Um, and, they're, you know, they're only about yay big, basically. And they 3D print them. And because of that, they can have just multiple machines just printing engines pretty much all day. So they have a high ability to output a lot of engines very quickly. And they do have nine of them. So you have kind of commonality. You're, you know, you're able to bring down the cost because they're making so many of the same things over and over, which is super cool. And then lastly, the biggest thing that they developed that I think is super cool is electric pumps. So not turbo pumps like what most rockets use. Almost basically any orbital rocket uses some kind of turboprop or turbo pumps um, to get to orbit. Other than that, the most simple thing to do is have a pressure-fed engine, but you're really not going orbital with a pressure-fed engine. So this is kind of a, a hybrid almost. It's taking using electrical pumps and electric uh, you know, batteries and pumping the fuel from the tanks, you know, sucking it from the tanks and pushing it to high pressure into the combustion chamber of these engines, of these Rutherford engines. Super cool. But um, of course, one of the coolest things they're working on right now um, is the recovery. So I talk, I have a whole video rundown on this if you guys need to watch it about, uh, about how they're going to be trying to swoop it out of the sky with a parachute after the booster comes in for re-entry. And kind of why doesn't SpaceX do that? You know, why didn't they try doing a helicopter recovery with their Falcon 9? Spoiler, it's substantially bigger. It'd take 
an order of magnitude larger helicopter to do something like that. But the other part, um, you know, people always ask, you know, why don't they do that with the fairings? Why doesn't SpaceX do helicopter recovery for the fairings? Um, so we kind of go through all that stuff when we talk about the different types of air recovery, because air recovery has been around um, since the 50s and 60s with the Corona uh, satellite program, well, 60s basically, but air recovery has been around and now we're seeing Rocket Lab kind of being the first one to try to swoop an orbital booster out of the sky. Super, 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 super cool. So there you go, guys. That is kind of your, your rundown. Again, if you want to look at this, go to everydayastronaut.com and click on pre-launch previews, and then you can get, get a rundown on this. And this particular article is written by Alex Crouch. So thank you, Alex. And again, also thank you to my awesome website crew for helping make this stay on top of everything and, and writing these awesome articles. They're really just doing a fantastic job. So how is everybody? I am back from Florida. Looks like we have some people to say hi to. We've got a couple new members, um, including... Uh, X Certain's Extreme, Hacken Thomas, Sam Hinsley, Gingerman512, Clay Bennett. Thank you guys. And we have uh, a little a message from Seth Kirk um, saying, Been a minute since I've been in a stream. Keep up the work, my bud. Here's a tip for my absence. Well, thanks, Seth. It's been a while too. How are you, man? Glad welcome back and welcome. I'm we're working on having the, the comments now, which I, I think is pretty cool. Um Let's see. So here's a good question from um, from Ravi Raj Rana. Is the rocket electric? So it's still using chemical propulsion. It's still an RP-1 based rocket engine. So it's it's still it's actually the exact same fuels that the Falcon 9 uses, that the first stage of the Atlas V uses, that the Soyuz rocket uses. It's it's the most common probably rocket fuel, which is just RP-1, rocket propellant one. And, and liquid oxygen, just like, you know, just like pretty much anything else. The difference is, instead of using, um, having basically a, a miniature rocket engine fire at a turbine to spin the pumps, they're just using an electric motor to spin the pumps. So it's really simple. They can tune it using software. There's no fancy valves. The engine's unbelievably simple, unbelievably elegant, and just like a clean slate, simple design, which was a very low risk path forward to be able to get to orbit. I mean, it's definitely probably one of the least expensive um, development programs to be able to get a rocket into orbit. And of course, you have to pay off that research and development. That research and development is not free. So they really did some cool work by by inventing and, and developing the electric pump engine. So um, so the, 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 the engine's not electric in the sense like like an ion engine where it's, it's throwing away you know, propellant like a Xeon thruster or something like that using like just purely electricity, but it is using electricity to run the pumps. Now, I did a video all about this basically already. So if you guys need to look, I have a Rocket Lab playlist here on YouTube. Take a look through there if you need to know more about the company and including again, those interviews with Peter Beck. But the fun thing about it, um, well, the, the big thing is that lithium ions are just not as power dense as RP-1. So they'll never be as high performance, but they're incredibly simple and I think a really elegant solution. So um, <laughs> Night Fox wants to know, have we ever had a pointy end up, flamey end down check fail? Are you really questioning my rocket orientation skills? <sighs> really? Honestly? We probably have had one at this point. <laughs> we probably have. Oh, geez. Oh, Hey, this is awesome. This is from Harshal Par uh, Pamar. This is my new favorite channel on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harshal. That means a lot. Um, we have an, another new membership from John Speckman. Um, okay, I, I answered this in the kind of in the rundown here, but the payload capacity of the electron is around 225 kilograms-ish to low Earth orbit. Um, I, and actually, I think it can do that to some synchronous orbit. So it might be able to do more like 250 for certain payloads in certain destinations. But it actually can even send stuff off to the moon. And 225 kilograms is what around, uh, I think I said, oops, I think I said 500 pounds earlier. I think it's it's really more like 475 pounds or something like that. Um, so it's it's definitely a small sat launcher. That's still about, uh, that. that's quite a bit less than even like the Falcon 1. But yeah, um, I feel like, hey, I should also... Um, Oh, Corona Kivo on our Discord wants to know how many kilowatts are the battery packs and what are the voltage proprietary? I have no idea. Actually, you know what? In that first long interview with, with Peter Beck, I think he actually does mention the kilovolt 
or the wattage or something of the motors. Basically, each motor that runs each pump, so the liquid oxygen pump and the, the RP1 pump, I think each one's almost as powerful, like almost as powerful as a small like four cylinder engine. That's how, and they're only like soda can size. They're, they're like this, uh, Hy-Vee brand sparkling water sized, obviously the industry standard for measuring electric engines. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, so that's pretty cool. Um, unbelievable unbelievably powerful little electric motors, which I think would be awesome for motorcycles. And Peter Beck one time made a rocket powered motorcycle. So maybe we can get him to make some electric motorcycles or go-karts. Oh, a track car. Like that would be awesome. Um, I should mention a uh, huge thanks to my Patreon supporters and those in the discord channel. Hi guys. Thank you guys for hanging out. Um, so if you guys want to join our awesome discord, our awesome, we have a phenomenal community of like-minded people that we're all here just kind of learning together. They'll see me script and edit and just kind of get all this, like we have this cool feedback and discussions as scripts are happening and things like that. So if you guys want to join that, uh, consider becoming a Patreon member by going to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut and you'll go, you'll join our, our awesome discord. So, Hey, that's awesome. Okay. So, um, let's see, will they be recovering? Will they be, um, from Ron it? Tatlani, will they be trying to recover the first stage with the helicopter for this launch? No, that will be on flight 17, and this is flight 12. So hopefully with some luck, that might be as early as August, you know, August, September. They're, they're really ramping up to be more than one a month, like, you know, maybe more like two every, or three every two months. So hopefully 12, this is 12, 13. 14, 15, 16. So it's actually seven. My guess would be about four months. Okay, so that's October. <laughs> okay, my bet is October is the first time they try to do the full one. So, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like Rocket Lab's live. We're going to go ahead and pull up their feed for you guys here. Um, okay, let's see here. I'll get this pulled up. And we're going to be listening in here too as well. Give me one second. New Year's atmosphere. Now let's take a look at the customers and satellites on board today's mission. Don't Stop Me Now is a rideshare to low Earth orbit for NASA, the National Reconnaissance Office, and the University of New South Wales Canberra Space. The spacecraft on board include NASA's Andesite satellite, which has been created by students and professors at Boston University to study the Earth's magnetic field as part of NASA's CubeSat launch initiative. There are also three payloads on board which are designed, built, and operated by the NRO. The mission was procured under the agency's rapid acquisition of a small rocket or Razor contract vehicle, which allows the NRO to explore new launch opportunities that provide a streamlined commercial approach for getting small satellites into space. This mission follows Rocket Lab's first dedicated mission for the NRO, which was Birds of a Feather, and that was launched in January of this year. The final small sat onboard electron is the M2 Pathfinder satellite, and this is a collaboration between the University of New South Wales Canberra space and the Australian government, and that will test communications architecture and other technologies. A huge thank you to our mission partners for choosing the flying board electron today. It's been great to be able to meet the needs of a diverse payload class, from national security to research projects, all in the same mission. Now, as usual, we will be ending the live broadcast shortly after kickstage separation, so we won't be bringing you live video of payload deployment. Keep an eye on our social media pages for updates regarding deployment after the webcast has concluded. But I'll be answering your questions after that. So I'll be sticking around for a while. So that's why we watch here. And I'll be, I have a lot of questions to catch up on you guys too. So um, yeah, you guys are awesome. It looks like we have a lot of really, really good questions. And I'm already kind of getting behind. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Maybe if we can, they, they might speak up here in a second. So I don't want to talk right over them. Please confirm all separation events are up. All, separ all separation events are armed. RF, please confirm stage two S band has been switched to high power flight. Confirmed. Avionics, please cycle vehicle camera logging and confirm. Confirmed. GC, please enable ground high speed logging and confirm. Yep. High speed ground logging is enabled. GC, please confirm that the range igniter pressures are in bounds. Out of pressures are within bounds. Stage one, please confirm. Stage one tank, press set points. Locks 400 KPA, Kiro 225. Confirmed both. Stage two, please confirm. Igniter pressures are in bounds. Confirmed. 
Stage 2, please confirm Curie Catalyst preheat is disabled. Disabled. And confirm that Stage 2 tank set points is LOX 365 KPA Kira 205. Let's confirm. You've been following Rocket Lab launches for a while. You know that we like to be creative with mission names and patches for each launch. And we've given this mission a particularly special name in honor of someone who had a crucial impact on Rocket Lab. We chose the name Don't Stop Me Now in dedication to Scott Smith, a Rocket Lab board member and friend to the team who passed away recently. Scott joined Rocket Lab's board in 2015, bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience from his time at Skybox, Iridium, and Digital Globe. Scott was a passionate, dedicated, and kind leader who would go to great lengths to help others achieve things in space that would ultimately help everyone down here on Earth. The Triple S on the mission pass represents his full name, Sanford Scott Smith, and Don't Stop Me Now is one of his favorite songs by Queen. We are honored to have worked with one of the pioneering entrepreneurs of the space industry, and our thoughts remain with his friends and family. So we're now sitting at T-minus awesome. eight minutes to lift off, and conditions are still looking good for today's launch. You've probably heard that development is currently underway here at Rocket Lab to make Electron's first stage reusable. We had some pretty big milestones toward this goal on our last two missions when we successfully guided the stages back to Earth in one piece after launch. While we will not be attempting to recover the first stage on today's mission, earlier in the year we reached an exciting milestone on our recovery program. Recently, we conducted a successful mid-air recovery of a test stage, which is a big step towards reusability. Let's take a look at that incredible footage. I wonder if it's going to be new footage. I'm going to double check that I have the quality highest on YouTube. It's going to be default to like lower quality. I want this good footage. Just so we don't get a copyright strike on the music, I'm actually going to go ahead and duck the music out. And I'm just pre going to pretend that, um, that I am now the music virtuoso um my voice is obviously i think we've seen this video before i don't remember now though but peter beck uh loves helicopters he's actually working on his license i think he actually oh yeah we've seen this video he i think he's actually working on it i don't know if he fully has his license yet but he's definitely working on it and so he he has a huge affinity towards the helicopters look at this there's three helicopters in the air because the camera helicopter is there too but for this, uh, I talked to him about this last time I spoke to him um, in the last interview. And yeah, it's really quite the operation. But what you can see, obviously, is uh, this was a test where they're just dropping basically a payload simulator, paylo a mass simulator. And and uh, then the other helicopter's pilot's job is to go and try and snatch it out of the air. And that's... <laughs> he makes it look really easy. And Peter said that in the interview that he's like, you know... <laughs> He may make it look really easy, but he was working hard to get it. But check this out. How cool is that? And it helps that this booster is only around like a metric ton or so um, when it's when it's empty. And they run the tanks to complete to absolute depletion. They can actually run the tanks um, all the way down. Um, which is really, really cool. That's something that you can't really do with a, a turbo pump because you, you, you could ingest bubbles and, and end up destroying the engines. But because these are electric pumps, it doesn't really matter. It, you know, at some point, once the tanks are dry, it's just no big deal. So they can actually run the first stage to complete depletion, which is really, really unique. Um, oh, the... Wait a minute. Chad, you're saying that the... The Electron can take 495 kilograms to orbit? Why was I thinking 225? Can someone double check that? For some reason, that sounds like twice as much as I was thinking. I thought that, that sounds more like the pounds to me, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And yeah, like I said, guys, we will get back to your comments here after this, but let's see. Um... <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> I think the... Oh, that didn't work. It didn't go up on air. I'll try again. Hold on. I may have lost my comments. Oh, I know why. I know why. I forgot to copy that over because I'm an idiot. But yeah, that video is up on YouTube. Just real quick, I'm going to take, I want to make sure I get your guys' um, chats up here. So I'm going to be adding this quick. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. <laughs> Paste. Okay. 
Let's test this. So there, there's stage one flight mission. Flight stage, stage one. one. Please confirm motor control HVTC is falling on stage one engines. Can confirm. And please confirm yes. stage one engines are back to idle. Confirmed. Stage one, please re-enable pre-valve heater. Enabled. Stage two flight mission. Go ahead, flight. Please confirm motor control HVTC has fallen. <laughs> fallen. No please confirm stage two engine is in idle. They're not saying they're not saying murder control. That is motor control. They just say things a little differently down there. <laughs> Discord. That's hilarious. So it sounds like they are in a hold right now, which, um, yeah, just means we're kind of going to be waiting around a little bit to, for them to reset or continue in the terminal countdown. I should point out here. Oh, first off, we need to do something very important, um, and that is, of course, that the uh, a, Appears to me, and this is, ah, oh man. It appears to me the pointy end up is up and the flamey end is down. So there, maybe that's what they're waiting on. That might have been exactly what they're waiting on. That's probably why they're in a hold because they hadn't heard my official pointy end up and flamey end down. Let's see. If it starts moving now. Lady Go for GC. You don't know Avionics. why. We'll see, we'll see. Um, but the other thing you should notice is, yes, this rocket is all black, but you'll notice there's an Lady awful Avionics. lot of... Please enable HV bat heaters uh, as required. Yeah. Copy. Just trying to see if Avionics, there's something. Avionics, RCO on Mishgord, proceed with a Foxshot 1700, AFTS hold procedure. Begin with Foxshot 1700. RF flight mission. Flight RF. Please decrease S2 and S1, S band to low power. Confirmed. So they did say they're doing something with the AFTS, which is the Automatic Flight Termination System. Uh, confirmed. Okay, flight on mission cord. Uh, be advised, MCC launch switch cover is uh, closed. Uh, RCO flight mission. Sir, RCO, go ahead. Please close the launch switch cover. Switch cover's down. <laughs> we have just had an update from Mission Control here. We are now entering a hold due to high winds. The team is working to revert the clock to T minus 12 minutes to hold for a gap in these winds. So please stand by and enjoy these beautiful views of Electron on the pad. Cool. Gives us some time to answer a few more questions. And <laughs> an innocent raptor in our Discord who had a birthday uh, a week or so ago, I think. So I want to say happy birthday to innocent raptor. Had a really good <laughs> question in our Discord channel. Wait. Wouldn't pointy end up okay, no would would actually be the pointy end down because they are down under? Is it even possible to do pointy end up down under? He's worried. You should be worried, honestly, because I don't really know. <laughs> uh, on the itch winds, uh, we're gonna move back around, loop back around to T minus twelve minutes and hold the edge. Okay, so it looks like they're gonna be going to T minus twelve. So let's answer a few more of you guys' questions. If I can get this chat to work again, I would love it. Um, let's see here. Let, let me see if I can send it up there. I am not getting it to work at this exact moment. Um, let me try something else again real quick. Sorry, you guys. You're just going to see my, my face. Hi, guys. Copy. Okay. Let's delete this one. <laughs> Yes, I'm positive. And why can't I paste a duplicate? Um, who knows, honestly, you know, that's the whole question. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know, but I'm trying to get you guys' chats back up on screen so I can answer them easier. Well, Kenneth Kroll says, I can't imagine what your sleep schedule is like covering launches from all hours, but I appreciate it. Sleep is... Sleep is for the people that sleep. I don't, I don't need it. Yes, I do. I, I'm a, I love sleeping, 
But yeah, it's, it's sometimes like, especially there's a couple nights in a row where Starhopper was going until like three or four or five a.m. or something. I don't even remember, and that got a little bit. <laughs> or Starship, not Starhopper. The Starship testing was going very late in the night, and that became quite difficult. Um, I'm going to try a few more of these. See if they. There we go. What materials are being used in the 3D printing process? I th I don't know exactly which uh, which metals are used, but it is metal printing. It's um. It's that kind, like his electric beam kind, where it's like a layer of powder and they basically put it together. It's, someone tell me what, what exactly that is. I don't quite remember. Um, Sintery? I don't remember. Oh, I was going to tell you guys too about why the rocket's black and white right now. So although the rocket is entirely black, the white parts, you can tell exactly where the liquid oxygen is because that is the cryogenic liquid oxygen tanks um inside there is liquid oxygen that's minus 183 degrees celsius because it's so stinking cold the humidity in the air attaches to the rocket you know and and it freezes on it and so basically that's just a, a sheet of ice a, a thin sheet of ice and you'll see that on on really all rockets you don't notice it so much on the falcon 9 because the falcon 9 is white but you do notice it on like the atlas 5 which has kind of that goldish color booster um, you'll see that it it gets half white on it during fuel up. So yeah, that's isn't that crazy that it's that distinct of a line where it's it's that cold. And you can see the, the venting of there and all the the condensation you're seeing is just because it's so cold that's coming in contact, you know, different bits coming in contact with the wind and the air, and it's freezing into condensation. It's just taking the little droplets of in the air and turning it into condensation. So um let me think. Uh, 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 what, what, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> okay, let me uh, let me keep answering you guys' questions here. Will I be back at Wallops for their next launch? I okay. Here's the deal. I always wanted my first Rocket Lab launch to be down in New Zealand. But now with just kind of the crazy year that's been unfolding, I just don't think that's going to be possible because I think they're going to be launching from Wallops really soon. And I think I actually need to even put my like press credentials in because I do want to go see that live. I think that would be awesome. That'd be such a cool launch to see live. So, yes. <laughs> um, how did they ignite the Rutherford engines? That's a great question. I don't remember. Does anyone remember? I don't remember if they, they might actually use TTEB. Um... I don't remember if they have T-Teb or not. For those of you oh. just joining us, oh, we're currently in a hold at T minus 12 minutes due to high winds. We'll keep you updated with information as it comes to hand. Okay, cool. Okay, so, um, yeah, if, if, if those of you wondering, uh, what, what were we just talking about? Oh, yeah, how do you light the Rutherford engines? Let me, uh, from, from, um, a re from a retra, uh, <laughs> a retra, how do they ignite the Rutherford? I don't remember if it's spark ignition or if it's T-TEB, which T-TEB would be triethyl aluminum, triethyl boring, which is um, pyrophoric, which means that's, it's not the same as hypergolic. It's very similar, but what it means is as soon as it comes in contact with an oxidizer, it spontaneously combusts. So they will run a little bit of oxygen through there, get the combustion chambers going and with the T-TEB, and then boop, there they go. Okay, let me see if someone remembers... I feel like I should know, uh, but I don't think they have, I don't think I remember. Okay. Um, thank you so much from Kenneth Moyer. You're awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, Brian Clausen for the membership. Thank you so much. Uh, also another membership from Howard Bar Bartlett. Thank you so much. Epic space models. Awesome. Um, thinking about making a model of Electron Cube with the good work. You absolutely should uh epic space models that would be awesome um and yes also thanks to all the super chats thank you guys so much um but yes uh epic space models please please do make a model of the electron i would absolutely love that um this is great here so this is from um planetary zero from wikipedia each engine has two small motors that generate 37 kilowatts 50 horsepower while spinning at 40,000 rpm there we go thank you so much for for finding that source there planetary that is awesome um, let's see, um, from Aiden Aldrich, I do believe that they use LiPo batteries. So lithium polymer instead of lithium ion, I think you would be right. I, they, I don't think they use lithium ion. That's probably correct. So thank you. 
Um, we have a new membership from Rodney Kemp. Thank you so much. Um, oh, this is awesome from Tobias Man. Uh, love your deep dives, especially the Aerospike Explainer. Keep it up. Well, thank you so much, Tobias. I, the Aerospike engine was one so of those. Right now, we oh. celebrated our three-year anniversary since launch. As we wait for winds to subside, let's take a look back at everything we've achieved in those three years. Sweet. This would be cool to just have in the background, so it's not just me talking to you guys. So. Yeah, let's, we'll just kind of have this in the background and I'll keep answering you guys' questions. So the, the Aerospike video that I produced last year was one of those moments um, for me, I like to be proven wrong. I really like having an opinion and then doing research and finding out that I'm wrong. Like that's the best outcome for me. Or what I like to do, because I did the same thing with, with the SLS, was I'm going to go talk to someone that's super, you know, advocating for the thing that I think sucks. Is the original title of the Aerospike video was going to be Why Aerospikes Suck. And I ended up talking to a bunch of people that, that told me the physics behind them that really got, that I got deep enough into it to realize that they don't suck. It's just that they're not really worth the trouble, frankly, is kind of the conclusion. But I love that moment. I love when you flip your, when you, you gain enough perspective on the subject to flip your perspective and actually have a, a more well, I'm not saying I'm perfect and like perfectly well-rounded, but to have more of a well-rounded, um, you know, opinion on something like that, I think that's a, a valuable lesson in life anyway, is, is if you are really staunch about some particular thing, is going and talking to people that, that think the opposite of you and, and trying to find yourself in some place in the middle. It's, I think, a lot healthier place to be, especially today with a lot of crazy things going on. <laughs> um, yeah. So here's a comment from Brian Clausen again. Thank you, Brian. I love following your channel, enjoying uh, space as much as I did when you were young. That is awesome, Brian. I really appreciate that. I have just had so much fun lately. We're doing a lot of cool things behind the scenes. This is a very busy time for me. I just got back from Florida, of course, with DM2, but I'm also working on a new studio and moving. Uh, I'm actually going to be staying here in Iowa, um, but also eventually by the end of the year, hopefully having some kind of small presence in Florida too, or like a, a place to put stuff in Florida as well. But so that means I'll be building out a new studio starting next week. And I'm also, uh, it's tax season. So it's just like, oh man, it's just busy, busy, busy times. So it might be a little bit of time before you guys get a produced video for me, unfortunately, but um, I'm really excited about the content that's gonna be coming out. Our list right now is like f really awesome, awesome stuff. I'm really excited about it. Oh. Join us today. We are in a T minus 12 minute hold due to high winds at, at Launch Complex 1 for our 12th Electron mission. We'll keep you updated as we hear more from the operators. Cool. Well, it's getting pretty there now. Is it sunrise? What time is it in New Zealand? Is it sunrise there or sunset? Or... I never know how that goes. It's always so confusing. I think it's sunrise in New Zealand, I would assume. It's like opposite of us right now in the Midwest. Um. Um, of course, I still love you in our Discord. Had a question. Technically, although it will never be done, does the SLS count as an SSTO because it can put itself into orbit? Absolutely not. It stages. The boosters, it would not be able to get to orbit without the boosters. Um, <laughs> oh, it's sunset. Really? How can it be sunset? We just had sunset here like six hours, like five, four hours ago. How could it be sunset already? Weird. That is spooky. My brain is breaking right now. Um, but no, SLS cannot get into it. it couldn't uh, under no circumstance be considered an SSTO. Even if you didn't have the boosters, it wouldn't be able to lift its tank with only. Um, I think it only has like one point five or so million pounds of thrust out of the four RS twenty fives. I'm assuming the core stage filled up would be and upper stage, well core stage all filled up would be a lot heavier than that. Although you might you might be able to do it actually because the RS twenty it depending on if you drain the or it had a thrust to weight ratio lower than one point oh, you might be able to SSTO the, the core stage. Only the core stage, nothing attached to it really. A small, small, small small payload. Might be possible, but don't forget, even like the original Atlas, the Convair Atlas, like the SM65A, had a staging event. It dropped its boosters, uh, or two of its, uh, sorry, not boosters, it actually dropped two of its engines, and then it had a sustainer engine. So it had one common tank, and then no upper stage even. The only staging event it did um, was dropping off some engines, and consequently, its payload capability was pretty much the weight of those engines. So that's just kind of how the math tends to work out, so... 
ish. Um, let's see. Um, JRS in our Discord has another question that I think is worth addressing. I've been confused on the progress of Starship. I've been seeing a lot of static fires and various other tests, but it's been almost a year since the last hop. When do you think we'll start seeing those? Maybe some content on Starship Roadmap. Well, that last video I had, um, SLS versus Starship, um, was definitely... Oh, Lisa! At, at headquarters. Hi, Lisa. Everyone say hi to Lisa. Lisa is awesome. Lisa helped with some research. Um, on on the rocket pollution video that I did, Lisa is just a great friend, and she's been a big fr uh, a friend of Tomorrow, the the awesome space show Tomorrow. If you guys don't watch T M R O here on YouTube, and hang out in their community, they're awesome as well. Some of my absolute best friends in the entire world, and Lisa's one of them. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you. Um, okay, so. Um, the question about S Starship progress, definitely watch that last video I have about SLS versus Starship and all that stuff because, you know, it's Starship is entirely milestone based. There's no like, it's, it's different. They're, <laughs> uh, they're literally, you're, you're just seeing this iterative thing. So you're not going to see a hop until they test out everything on this newer design compared to star hopper so serial number four was darn close to hopping if the umbilicals that detached to fuel up the the vehicle didn't have some kind of catastrophic failure we likely would have seen a hop like last week already so it was really really close to being hop ready and now luckily we're seeing it the same type of thing where um serial number five six and even seven are pretty much ready to go and the pad's almost already fixed up again so we're waiting. It'll be any second before, um, you know, I think the the hop of the first next hop or the next hop of the first next hop. I don't know. The next hop of Starship will likely be in um, within a month or so. I have no idea. <laughs> See, look at this, guys. We have official members of Rocket Lab giving us updates on this live stream. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa, for the for the real time update from headquarters. <laughs> Seriously, how cool is the space community? I mean, honestly, that is just like the best. Um, we definitely owe a huge shout out, real quick, to the mods. Thanks to the mods for staying up. Um, <laughs> yeah, does Lisa know that the chat says hi? Um, let's see here. Hang on. Uh, but uh, we also had a, a big thank you from Graham for the mods. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, Mad King says, "Why don't oh, why don't we fly rockets out of the atmosphere?" I'll talk. Complex one up on screen, so you can enjoy these beautiful sunset views on the Mahia Peninsula. I appreciate the sunset views. Seriously, that is gorgeous. I'm also gonna lift up my chair. Ugh. I feel like there we go. That's so much better. Okay, so we're just gonna chill. I love this. Rocket Lab's playing some music, um, which I, I'm afraid to play because we might get copyright strike. Did did did. But, um, okay, Mad King Ares says, let me see if I can put it up again. I might not be able to. Why don't we fly rockets out of the atmosphere like an airplane? So I'll be doing a video kind of talking about air launching. As you might know, Virgin Orbit is working on air launching with their, uh, with their rocket as well. But, it, okay, so why don't we fly rockets out of the air like an airplane using, using lift? It ends up basically being... You want to get out of the atmosphere as quickly as possible. Unless you're using the atmosphere in your engine, like as the oxidizer for your engine, or as reaction mass, like a propeller or a jet engine where you're sucking air in and actually you know, accelerating out the back, and that is your reaction mass. Or if you're sucking in oxygen and using that with your engine. Um, other than that, those, those would offer an advantage. But rockets don't do that. Rockets, um, at least a traditional vertical rocket, uses... Um, it has its own built-in oxygen. It has its own built-in fuel. And the reaction mass is the, the combination of those two things. And it just needs to get out of the atmosphere as quickly as possible so it's not slowing the vehicle down. Because obviously there is air resistance that is that the rocket is fighting, especially in the first 10 kilometers or so. After that, it gets thinner and thinner. And after max Q, the, the pressure drops, uh, even though the rocket's continuing to accelerate. Now, the reason why they don't make like a, you know... There's companies working on flying rockets more like airplanes, such as uh, you know the the Skylon with the Saber engine by um, Reaction Systems Limited or whatever their their reaction. Um, you know, so there's definitely there's definitely some solutions out there, and people are are pursuing that. 
but frankly, it's um, it's the, the the trade-off normally ends up being it's just not really worth it. Like rockets, I, I know all of us are obsessed with like really maximizing and utilizing. You know, like oh, they could probably get like five percent more efficient if they did this. But in order to do that, you're actually adding a lot of complexity. You're adding a lot of new technology, unproven technology, or in the case of like Virgin Orbit, you're having to now fuel up a rocket on an airplane have that rocket drop, let go of it, and then have it ignite in the air. You can't ignite and, and hold on to it and make sure everything's going. You have to drop it and commit to flight before the engine's even running. So there's definitely like risks and um, a lot of things involved in that process as well. So um, there's, there's just a lot of complications to why they don't really fly like an airplane, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if we see it someday because there are certain advantages and I would love for someone to exploit some of those advantages. Um, here we go. We also have um, Andy Law from our, our Discord and a uh, helper. Uh, again, a friendly reminder, if you guys need to know more about today's launch, you can just go to everydayastronaut.com, click on pre-launch previews, and you'll see the uh, the preview for Don't Stop Me Now. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for this, Kenneth. <laughs> we don't need a donation train. Trust me, I, I about crap my pants already from, <laughs> from TM2. Seriously, uh, you guys were far too generous already, so it's making me really figure out how I'm going to step up the studio game and, and bring you guys some more and more cool stuff. Um, uh, Jason Jacobson, Tim, if you could make your own satellite or probe, money isn't an option, what would you send to space and where? Well, I'm going to pretend that money is, of course, the, the real concern, because I actually talked about this with Peter Beck in the last um, interview I had with him. He was mentioning... Um, you know, uh, he was he's a big fan of Venus, and he mentioned that their new Photon upper stage is kind of like a kick stage slash satellite bus. And th this is something that Rocket Lab does that I think is one of those things that is I, I didn't realize how smart it was until the last two interviews where I was talking to Peter, and I realized like oh 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 this is actually like game changing. <laughs> this is a really really big deal. But what Photon's going to be doing. Um, a lot, it's going to be by uh, have options for biprop, so it'll have um, a proper instead of just cold gas thrusters to be able to power it like the Curie kick stage. It'll actually have biprop, which can have a lot higher performance, a lot more delta v potential, a lot higher specific impulse, and they can turn it into potentially a lunar lander if they want. They can send stuff to the moon. They can send stuff interplanetary. He even said he could send something to. Uh, to Venus, which would just be incredible. So that got me thinking about like, you know, could we make a Venus? You can almost float stuff in the atmosphere, like a dirigible or like a almost almost like a you know a, a ship sitting on top of Venus's thick atmosphere, and then get some cool cameras or something. I think that's what I would like to do. Would be make a some kind of like cloud, the beginning of a cloud city. Oh, what's the sunset from L LC one? Obviously, stage one lights up the sky upon ascent, but if the timing and trajectory align, stage two can also put on a show. What you're seeing here is a video from Ooh. Flight 10 as stage two reached a sufficient altitude to escape the Earth's shadow. This exposed the stage and its exhaust plume to the sun's rays. As the plume was illuminated, it reflected down a brilliant blue trail of light. If we're lucky, we'll have a similar result this evening. That's so cool. It's called um, the twilight phenomenon backscattered lighting. So it happens either about um, an hour uh, for the hour after sunset. If a rocket launches, um, it, it, it happens. Well, it happens at about an after after sunset or the hour before sunrise. But it's, it's best if you're on the East Coast to do it uh, in the morning for sunrise because the the illumination will be coming from the back and lighting it from the back, which is gorgeous. Or on the West Coast, like Vandenberg, um, or even if they were to launch west with this, which they can't because they'd be flying over New Zealand. But you know, if you're if you're launching from the west coast, uh, having a sunset launch is best because then it's again backlit illuminated instead of foreground illuminated. It's just it's just a prettier thing. But anyway, I think my ultimate probe would be to send something to Venus now and have like a the beginning of a sky colony, uh, like a cloud city or something like Star Wars, and have cameras on it or something. Maybe it's something we can crowdfund someday. I have no idea. Um, yeah, I think just think that'd be super, super cool. So Peter kind of got me. Um, <clears throat> good call, Andrew. Um, so yeah, I think Peter kind of got my brain thinking about like, how could we crowdsource the world's first cloud city on another planet? And 
how cool would that be? So I think Rocket Lab would be a pretty viable option for that. Space blimp time. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. This is from uh, Kai Nguyen. <laughs> hey, Tim, Jelly Dude here. Are there any Rocket Lab plans for medium sat launchers? Thanks, Tim. Um, so Kai uh, or Jelly Dude, anytime anyone asks Peter Beck about a, rod, a larger rocket, he says, we're not building a larger rocket. They have a very dedicated, they have already have more launches than they can fulfill just in the small sat launch market. They're they're absolutely dominating this market because they, they can quickly fulfill rides and they're working on a cadence and a dedicated ride program that no one else can offer. So, you know, you have to think about it this way. Um, people often ask like, how, how can they compete with SpaceX? They're likely potentially more, you know, there might be certain crossovers where SpaceX would be sig significantly cheaper. You know, if you're right at this certain kilogram ratio and size, you might be able to do a ride share thing, but you might be waiting a year or two years to get to space. And sometimes that year or two years, it'd be worth spending more or for sure equal to be able to get there sooner. Because the sooner you can demonstrate your technology, the sooner you can get your systems online, the sooner you can prove out something, you know, that is a competitive advantage for you and your company. And that is something that, that Rocket Lab's really trying to capture is a lot of those people that are working on little technologies, working on something, and they want to get flying ASAP. And Peter says that they can uh, w eventually, they're trying to catch up on their backlog, I think, because they're so popular. And of, of course, the pandemic didn't help it. But um, you can basically, if you, if you call them up and say, hey, I want to get this in space, they can do it pretty much within about two months, I think, was what he said. So, um, which is super, super cool. JRS in our Discord wants to know, is Electron using super chilled propellants? Um, and do load and go like Falcon 9. No, the, they are, as you can tell, it's just sitting there chilling on the pad now. So they are not super chilled. They're pretty much right at just liquid oxygen temps and regular room temp RP1, from my understanding at least. Um, what's the engine specific impulse from Pablo? It's a great question. I believe the upper stage is, is close to 350 seconds. It's like 344, 348 or something like that off the top of my head. Uh, very high efficiency kerosene engine for, for an RP-1 that's that's with the best of them basically, right on par with the Merlin. And the first stage I think is also similar to the Merlin as well. But don't forget it's Although they're similar, they're not quite as um, mass efficient because the batteries are less energy dense than the actual chemical bonds of the fuel, of the fuel and oxidizer. So, um, yeah, so it, it, it it's kind of it, trade-offs. You know, there's always trade-offs. Every, everything about rockets is always some kind of trade-off. So um, here's a good question. Will Starship be able to hover like a new Shepard booster? Yes, I think. Likely, I have no idea though. Um, I think it will. I think it will. I mean, obviously, right now it can hover. Uh, as Starhopper obviously had the ability to hover, but I I don't know when it comes down to it, what exactly the minimum thrust to weight ratio will be with even a single Raptor. Now, don't forget they're likely going to be landing with um, three sea level Raptors for Starship, because. Uh, for redundancy purposes, you're relying on those engines to land safely. And with engine out capability, you know, you'd, if you lose one on that reentry or on the, on the landing, you know, you'd still have two running. So with three, your, your thrust to weight ratio is going to be very high um, unless they figure out a way to really, truly deep throttle the Raptor. But I, from what I understand, I don't think they're able to go too much below half throttle setting it on Raptor. Maybe they might be working on that now that they're getting more experience with it. But that is something that I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it will ever really hover for the landing, but it's a good question. Um, let's see here. From Iconium9000, can you do a video about getting jobs in space? Um, like in the space industry or in space, actually in space? Because frankly, to be perfectly honest, I am no one you should be talking to about either of those things. I don't know, honestly, the first thing about the job market, to be frank, uh, I've never really, I haven't worked for another individual since 2008. I quit my job as a, at a camera store in 2008 to pursue professional photography. And then um, I started doing Everyday Astronaut full-time in 2017. <laughs> on January 1st, started with a whopping 200 YouTube subscribers. So if you're one of the first 200 YouTube subscribers that have been with me since 2017, thank you guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, 
Yeah, I honestly do not know too much about uh, the current job market at all, but it's worth uh, applying, I guess. I don't really know. <laughs> um, here is from Constellation. Thanks for covering all these launches, Tim. Uh, I'm never getting tired of all the hard work everybody getting to see in action. Thanks again for bringing all of, all of us this amazing content. You're welcome, Constellation. See, that's that's the whole point of Everyday Astronaut is that there are people out there working their butts off to do really, really cool things for humans. And it's my job to basically be a professional space cheerleader and get you guys excited by explaining why this stuff is cool and why it makes me excited. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for hanging out with me and thanks um, <laughs> and thanks for all that. <laughs> Seth Kirk in our Discord says, no, Tim, you work for us now. <laughs> I do work for you guys. <laughs> Sorry. Um, from Tyler LeBlanc. Hi, Tim. I love your videos. And I know it's been established that Delta Four and Falcon Heavy can't launch Orion to the moon. But what about New Glenn? So that is a great question, Tyler. Um, that's going to be part three of my SLS versus versus Starship kind of thing. I don't really know what to call it anymore because it's changed a lot because there's still more stuff coming out constantly. Part two is now morphed into Artemis versus Apollo, and it's going to really dive into the cost of SLS, the cost of Orion, the cost of the Artemis program, comparing that to the way we used to do things and the way we got to the moon in the first place with Apollo. We're even going to be comparing the orbits and how the two different missions are completely different and how uh why we're landing on the south pole why we're getting into a thing called near rectilinear halo orbits we'll be doing all of that i'll be really diving deep into this so that'll be part two part three will be are there any other options besides sls to get humans to the moon in 2024 so i will answer that question and that's a fantastic question so thank you tyler um Isaac wants to know what is the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office. It's it's basically um, it's it's basically just um, whatever it's called. Secure <laughs> it's Department of Defense. There we go. Oh, I'm tired. Let's see here. This is from Chaz, dude. Do you think there will ever be an electron heavy like Falcon Heavy? Would it would be really cool, but I'm not sure how useful. Also, hi hi Chaz. Um, well, first off, thank you. And I do not think that having parallel boosters is honest. I don't think it, it offers as much benefit as just making a bigger rocket. There are a lot of things that do not scale. So all of a sudden you have to redesign your core anyway to begin with, because now it has other lateral loads and other loads from those boosters. You have multiple flight computers. Now you have all that complexity there. You, you lose mass fraction because or, or match your mass fraction, or you don't gain it. Because if you actually make a tank bigger, the volume of the tank goes up by the area of the thing. <laughs> the volume goes up by the cube of the surface area square. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, basically, um, if you take a take a circle, take a tube, and if you double that diameter, your internal volume actually goes up four times. Is that right? something like that. It you gain efficiency by actually having larger things and I, I think it would be they'd be better off if they were to make a heavier more higher performance rocket. I think they'd likely just scale up the booster, scale up the upper stage. Um make more of a medium class rocket than try to do a, an electron heavy. So, yeah. Um let's see from um Anon says how does launcher 1 compare to electron? So, they're very similar class rockets. Uh, Launcher one is, is Virgin Orbit's orbital class rocket that they're trying to launch and, and attempted to launch just about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Very close. They they got all the way to commit and it was awesome. But um, yeah, so um, oh people yeah in our Discord are asking about why there's like chunks kind of flying off the rocket. That is just because of the wind and some of the ice chunks kind of breaking free in some of those stronger bits of wind. That shows you how cold this vehicle is. Again, if you went up and touched it right now. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that because your hand would like stick to it because it's that cold. Um, so Launcher 1 and Electron, I'll be doing a video about Launcher 1 and about air launching uh, very soon. That's that's on, that's on in the next, one of the next three videos. The, the next, the three videos that are kind of urgent, oh, there might be four because I might be do, doing one about Perseverance versus... Yeah, I'm going to try slipping in Perseverance versus Curiosity and, and what changed on the Perseverance Mars lander. Although I could probably do that right before it lands. I don't have to try to rush that out before it launches. 
I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, I have the Artemis versus Apollo coming out. I have air launching. I have a, a Russian engine history and family tree that's going to be really interesting. Um, and then, yeah, Perseverance versus... I've got a lot. Oh maintaining a holding status before we resume the countdown and once again this hold gives our operators a chance to pause select the best opportunity for launch and then continue operations with 12 minutes remaining on the clock okay dope hopefully it happens soon because <laughs> i'm it's almost 1 a.m for me here so i know a lot of you guys in the u.s are staying up pretty darn late so fingers crossed we actually see a launch tonight um, okay, let's see here. From Night Fox, my birthday was on the 5th. Anyway, thanks for a wonderful stream as always. Well, thank you, Night Fox. Everyone wish Night Fox a happy birthday. That is, uh, that is awesome. Happy birthday just a couple, couple nights ago. And you know what? Oh, I have a, that's weird. Well, get out of here. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's happening on my watch. I was trying to figure out what day it was and I already got lost and confused because I'm, like I said, I'm that type of, I, I need to know Night Fox. Do you actually own a fox? Because that would be awesome. Foxes are like the perfect blend between cats and dogs. I, I, I always debate, would I rather have a fox that was like nice and more... Because they're pretty crazy. Or a raccoon. Also, I want it like not crazy. Because I just love their little hands. I just think... Or a squirrel. A squirrel is, is way up there, actually. Um, I know there's the stuff you guys are coming here, obviously, to learn about rockets, raccoons, and squirrels. So you're welcome. Okay, um... From the Texan eighty three, gonna uh, gonna be hard pressed to to let wait to get let in, Tim. Arden trying to keep the border closed for up to two years. Really? <laughs> so it might not be anytime soon if I can really holy cow. Well, I mean, New Zealand is officially COVID free, so um, I guess they can go back to normal life but still can't have like any tourism or anything like that. Man, that's wild. But maybe I can go there someday. Um, yeah. Um, this is from Aiden. Um, are the rocket engines made by Rocket Lab? Yes, they are. Everything on this vehicle is made in-house, including the motors. Um, I think they probably source the batteries, I think, but they build the motors in-house. They build everything in-house pretty much. This is a... Uh, you need to watch. I have videos showing their the factory floor uh in new zealand it is awesome and then they actually build the avionics and the engines in california so they ship those since they're pretty small they ship those out to new zealand and then yeah but they're all built by rocket lab um thank you from jackson armstrong and also a, a thanks to happy hacking video blog as always thank you I, I you're i love that you're always around i really appreciate that and thanks for saying i rock i appreciate that um, we have a new membership from 556 Famous. Thank you for that. And <laughs> this is from Kevin Nelms. Funding for building rocket astronaut chill dash da or <laughs> astronaut gold, astronaut badge, astronaut scream, astronaut shuttle. Oh, these are all the... <laughs> these are all the things. I, I see now what happened. Thank you, Kevin. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> Jeez. Again, it's, it's almost like it's 1 a.m. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again, Kevin. You're awesome. Um, let's see. Tristan. Hey, Tim. Since we are all for the advancement of space information and love, do you mind putting a word out to help Lab Padre, who also got a bogus copyright strike, and get them demonetized? Yes, I was actually talking to Lab Padre. That stuff is unbelievably frustrating. Um, all they have to do is, and I gave them the advice on Twitter, was... Uh, they can pretty easily dispute it. It might take a day or two, but that is so frustrating to me that that uh, people are actually getting demonetized for their original work and their original feeds, you know. So, yeah, um, shoot. I, I really, really appreciate all the work that Lab, Pod, Lab Padre does. So hopefully they get it figured out really quickly and gets resolved because that is totally bogus. Um <laughs> from Jose, is it true that Elon is seriously dying on, or serious in dying on Mars? Um, uh, yeah, he he's said for years that he would like to die on Mars, just not on impact. So um, that's kind of his goal. I, I'm not going to put it past him. It's Elon. <laughs> this is from um, Apurv. Uh, thank you so much for your generous donation. You are awesome. 
This is a membership from uh, Malhan. Thank you so much. Let's see here. This is from uh, Cabinet Casadea. I wonder how they deal with how 3D printed metal stuff has bad material faults. Once heard it was a big problem with 3D printed rocket motors. Well, uh, you know, I think that's something that's pretty well figured out because SpaceX also 3D prints rocket motors. They, they're they Super Draco, the Super Draco motors that are their abort motors on the uh, Dragon capsule that we just saw launch Bob and Doug a week and a half ago or whatever. Those are also 3D printed. So um, I, I think it's a pretty well solved thing at this point. But uh, yeah, I... I'm not sure, and, and you have you have companies like Relativity Space that's working on 3D printing entire rockets, not just the motors, but the entire vehicle. So, yeah, it, it's it's a promising thing for sure. So, yeah, holy cow, wow! Thank you so much, five five six famous Tim. I've been watching your videos for a while now. New member, awesome channel. Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you so much, five five six famous. Everyone, please give five five six famous. Uh, uh, thank you t from all of us. That really, really means a lot. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Clay Bennett um, says, what was my favorite part of your press experience for DM2? You know, it was very different this time because of all the pandemic stuff. We couldn't really engage with our friends and the, the other members of the press, which is unusual. You know, we're having to maintain social distance and wearing masks and things like that. But by far, my favorite part besides the launch, launch was great, but was driving my own car up onto 39A. Like that was absolutely mind boggling. I kind of lost my mind when I was literally driving through the gate. Like I can do this and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get shot. Like <laughs> that was unbelievable. Well, besides that also it was really, really fun talking with Elon Musk and Jim Bridenstine the day before, well, the initial attempt that was huge. That was super fun. I mean, I just, I could talk to those guys all day long. Um, I didn't even know that Jim Bridenstine was going to be there, which was an awesome surprise. Uh, if you don't know who Jim, Br Jim Bridenstine is, the administrator of NASA, pretty much the head honcho at NASA, super cool guy. Um, that was obviously huge, but I, I you know, I, I think there's going to be many more of those to come if I'm like, not. hopefully that's not being arrogant, but I just feel like um, we have a great time talking and I would like to continue doing so. And... But for me to be able to drive my own car onto launch pad 39A, where people left to go to the moon, where 82 space shuttles took off from, I mean, come on. That was like, oh, man. Yeah. Hold on. I had to... <laughs> I had to put this in Discord. That's staying in Discord. Don't, don't tell anyone that. <laughs> um... Let's see here. This is, um, so thank you for the great question. This is from um, Climb, Climb, oh, will they recover it with the helicopter? Uh, not this time. The first time they will attempt to recover with the helicopter will be flight 17. This is flight 12. So we've got a little ways to go. Again, my prediction would be somewhere around end of September, October-ish would be when we hopefully are seeing that. So yeah, great question. Um, from Tristan Rogers, also love your channel and merch. Thank you so much, uh, Tristan, uh, again. But I, I do have to say, <laughs> I'm not pushing merch and not doing a live stream. Today I'm wearing an Electron shirt because um, our merch store got slammed on DM2. We had, at some point, I think we had like 70,000 viewers and I mentioned the web store and we broke the web store basically. So um, the the shop is, is feverently trying to fulfill orders. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so if you are one of those people that have ordered since dm2 or during dm2 uh we're almost caught up i think they're almost caught up but we had to do like whole new runs of shirts and which just blew my mind so thank you to all those that 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 shopped around but I, i'm not going to even really mention the store today because it's like they need to catch up so give them some time and thanks for your patience on for those of you guys that did order you guys are awesome um let's see time now you might know that we never want to hold again but sometimes <laughs> that's exactly what we need to do when the weather doesn't play ball we are still in that t minus 12 hold as we wait for winds to fall into that in, into acceptable balance for launch and thanks for standing by if i remember it they have about i think they have until um the next hours 30 so i think we have about 35 more minutes in their launch window today before um before they can no longer 
uh, go for today, and they'll just have to scrub it. So we'll we'll stand by all the way through the lunch window, and I'll keep answering your guys' questions. Let's see. Um, Caesar says, did you say the white on the electron currently is actually a layer of ice from fueling? Absolutely. Inside that rocket, in those parts that are white, is liquid oxygen. And again, liquid oxygen is minus 183 degrees Celsius. It's very cold. And because of that, you're literally just seeing, you know, it, it, it's it's the carbon fiber that comes in contact with it is so cold that the condensation in the air ends up building up around the vehicle and yeah and creating like a, a thin layer of ice which is just absolutely astonishing really so super cool i love stuff like that about space flight so counterintuitive we have a new a new member from jeff wilson thank you so much um astro six just bought full flow shirt and the mask. Love them. And thank you for providing quality products. We'll always support and keep up the great work. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, again, sorry for, uh, like I said, I'm not really trying to talk about the merch so we don't break the store again, but I, I am really proud of what the store has been doing in the past year, you know, with the custom hand sewn on things, the whole experience now, you know, with the Mylar packaging and all that stuff. Um, I, I just love it. We're working really hard. We're actually working on one of the things we're working on in the background. We are trying to figure out European fulfillment so that we'd actually have uh, that is actively being pursued. So we're working on trying to get like a, we're figuring out what the best option is. If we should produce our products, the same shirts, including like sewing and all that stuff, which would be harder for quality control for us in Europe and then just distribute from there. Or would we be better off doing mass shipments, you know, like, basically shipping pallets of merch to a warehouse and fulfilling from Europe. So the, the, the lead times, the shipping times are a lot shorter. The prices for shipping are a lot smaller because international shipping is horrible. Like it is so bad. It's got, it gotten so much worse even because of COVID. Um, as I mean, we take like, we take the actual amount that the DHL or USPS or whoever charges us and we actually discount it like somewhere between 30 and 40 percent for international shipping so there's times there's certain orders we will end up losing money because that 30 to 40 percent discount on shipping can in some weird edge cases be more than our profit margin that's how messed up international shipping is so trust me i totally get it um but we're working on finding solutions because i think it's i think it's important we have the channel has like 60 percent of you guys watching are from outside of the united states so hi hello everyone uh, which is, I, I love that. I love the international community. It's, it's so fun. So, um, um, let's see here. Okay. Here's another question from, um, Apurv. So saying down under is so relative. <laughs> Do we even know which way the earth faces relative to the universe? Absolutely. We do do not. It's all relative. It's all, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's all, yeah, you, you nailed it. It's all relative. That's a great observation. Um, greetings from Australia from Angus. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Angus. That really means a lot. Um, let's see. Ooh, um, this is a, this is a very interesting comment from Bol, uh, Bolake the Muskrat. Tim, you may know me on Twitter as Blake Donahue. My first three Carelock engines have been destroyed when they reach full thrust. Losing faith in building a company. Got any inspiration slash tips? Yes, I do actually. Um, I, it hit me on the on the way down. Ooh, they actually have the countdown clock going. I wonder if if that's a thing. It's kind of getting wonky. But maybe we'll hear they're coming out of a hold right now. Some good news we've had from the operators at Mission Control. We'll be resuming the countdown. As you can see, we're at nine, T minus 9 minutes and 54 seconds and are cleared for launch. Yes, that is excellent. Okay, my, my word of advice. It's different a little bit with rockets, I think, than in life because rockets require like money and time and a lot of effort and building and like all of the things. But one of the things that I, I just recently really reflected on was how failure has been one of the biggest fuels for me. Like when I fail, it's, and not like in the Elon Musk way of like, failure is not a problem if you don't learn anything from it or whatever the, the thing is. For me, it's been those like times that I had a missed opportunity or was like denied something, like a job offer or an opportunity. One of the big ones that sticks in my head is at the Falcon Heavy demo mission. 
I wasn't, I was, I was there as a member of press, but I like wasn't even allowed to go to the press conference because like they, they, the post launch press conference, because it was such limited space. They only had like, you know, 50 people. So they chose, you know, the top news people. And I, you know, I went up there and go, can I, can I come in? And I got denied at the door. And I literally probably, probably had like little tears in my eyes. And I remember just being like, this will never happen again. I, I told myself that I walked out the door and I said, I'm going to step up my game to the point where I will never be in that position again. And, you know, two years later, uh, interviewing Elon Musk and Jim Bridenstine in the firing room leading up to <laughs> returning humans to space, like absolute dream come true. But I remember that moment very clearly of this will never, I, I will, this will, this is not an option again. And, um, using those moments as fuel when, when the haters and doubters, you know, you always people haters fuel your whatever people always say that kind of stuff it's true you can use those like those doubts when when people say like yeah i don't think that's that's gonna work you know sometimes you just have to be like yeah yeah well i'm gonna show you I'll, I'll i'll show you how you know and um that's that's what i would say like oh off opportunity but one key component involves performing a cola or collision on launch assessment a collision on launch assessment is pretty self-explanatory, but it checks the flight trajectory against the catalog of objects in orbit. Everything from other satellites, the International Space Station, orbital debris, even other rocket stages need to be tracked in order to find a safe window for launch. Cool. Um, yeah, that would be my uh, Blakey the Muskrat. I would say just take those times of failure to reflect and and figure out how you're never going to make that mistake again or how you're going to or or using the people saying that it's impossible to you how you're going to prove them wrong i to me that's a, a powerful fuel um zachary um always love space but your videos truly inspired inspired me to succeed in hopes of working in the field i just graduated as valedictorian of high school and and i am to thank thanks for inspiring my dreams holy cow zachary Dude, huge congratulations. Valedictorian. Well, <laughs> this is just the beginning for you, my friend. I feel like, geez, that is some awesome stuff right there. Um, I'm sure you had no problem getting into the college and pursuing the actual, uh, you know, the path that you want. Oh, the strong back's starting to retract, it looks like, just a little bit. The, you'll notice the little tower next to the rockets beginning to peel back a little bit. But, dude, that is awesome. Huge congrats. Uh, we're all cheering for you. I have no doubt you'll end up doing uh, doing whatever you put your, your mind to. Seriously, that is awesome. So thank you for, for watching and hanging out and, and being part of our community too. That really means a lot to me. Um, let's see here from, from Lorik. Hi, Tim. I love your content. Awesome watching your channel grow. Sunset in New Zealand currently. <laughs> Remember, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere now, which means sunset is really early. That's a great call from South Africa. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm that far behind, aren't I? I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying really hard five t minus five minutes and 54 seconds and counting that white vapor you see rising from an electron is actually the liquid oxygen boiling off its tanks these tanks need to be continually topped up so that electron is ready for flight at t0 thanks josiah o'neill there uh with kind of the same take uh, again I, I was talking about that like half hour ago i'm, I'm sorry that it's taking me this long to catch up um from chad some of these guys <laughs> I think I owe you a drink after messing up my units. Cheers, Tim. <laughs> hey, it happens to the best of us. I just, uh, it was off my my memory that I was saying 225 kilograms. So I was hoping that I wasn't wrong. So no problem, Chad. Thanks for saying hi again. Uh, let's see. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Cool to see a rocket launch in the country. Living from Buster. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to try and get through these a little bit quicker here so we can get caught up. Um, let's see. Uh, from Ar Arthur Harris, thoughts on ULA's recovery system for Vulcan. I honestly think it's rather neat, especially with the potential for theoretical upper stage recovery. So the Vulcan rocket is planning to eventually use a system called Smart Reuse, where they will detach the engines from the fuselage, um, inflate a hypersonic uh, balloon, basically, and then re-enter the atmosphere. And the... the Teams have also returned to full production capacity of not just our electron launch vehicles, but our photon satellites as well. From day one, our mission has been to open access to space. We started with launch, the common problem faced by the entire industry. We've now ticked this box with electron and now we're moving on to the next step in making space easy, satellites. Rocket Lab's photon spacecraft line is designed to offer reliable, flexible, and affordable satellite solutions that enable small satellite operators to do more, spend less, and reach orbit faster. 
We're looking forward to sharing the first Photon mission in the coming months. So we're now sitting at four minutes and two seconds until liftoff, so I'll hand you over to the operators in mission control as they perform their final calls in the lead up to launch. Awesome. I'll kind of have this in the background, but I'll keep answering the, the Vulcan is, of course, uh, United Launch Alliance is kind of follow up to the Atlas V and the Delta is kind of going to fit in between the Atlas V and the Delta and totally end up replacing them, the Delta IV. Um, and they will be trying to detach the engines using then an inflatable heat shield, re-enter, throw a parachute up and recover it with a helicopter, a lot like what Electron is doing. So I think it's a cool system. My only, my okay, only wish now, is that I really analysis. wish that they had... Um, sped up the timeline on it personally because it well, they've announced that in like 2014 and i don't think they're going to try doing that until like 2022 ish or something like a really long time i wish that they had been a little more aggressive with it like you know had vulcan ready to go and ready to do smart reuse right from the get-go that'd be awesome but i definitely think it's a very potentially valuable system especially because those be7 engine or be4 engines are not cheap so yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, this is from your different I have more viewers than Rocket Lab streams <laughs> hey I mean all it's all the same you know all ships rise with the tide so I'm just happy that we can hopefully introduce some more people to Rocket Lab's work and moving to terminal count revert ooh did they just have a hold Yeah, they're back in a hold. So I'm guessing the wind is an issue again. You can definitely tell it's windy there. I mean, you can just see how much it's blown away. So like I said, we have about 24 minutes or so, or around 20 minutes or something like that in the launch window. Let me actually really quickly confirm it here how long the launch window is till 32 so we have about 25 minutes left in the launch window today <laughs> again uh thank you steven <laughs> my bad um this is from robert awesome tell your kids hi and hopefully they're not staying up too late i don't know what time it is wherever you are but thank you so much robert uh and and thanks for having your whole family sit around and watch a rocket launch that's super cool that's what a that's what a good family does. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, thank you so much, Jike. Uh, the last SpaceX Starlink launch, they did not recover the fairings. It was not successful, that launch. Can you view a Rocket Lab launch in person, like at KSC? Yes, um, you, can, you can view a Rocket Lab launch if you're down in New Zealand for these launches. You need to be near the Mahia Peninsula. Or coming up soon this year, you'll be able to view them even from like Washington, D.C. You'll be able to see Rocket Lab's launch because um, they'll be launching from wallops. As you heard is... from our mission control operators, we are in another hold due to high winds. We are planning to recycle the count back to T-12 minutes, minutes and we'll hold here for a gap in the wind. Okay, they're trying. They're still trying. Darn it, wind. But yes, um, you can absolutely view a Rocket Lab launch in real life. If, if you live in the eastern United States, you'll be able to do that very soon. Okay, let's see here. Why do they flush the uh, combustion chamber with nitrogen before ignition? To be honest, I don't exactly no i think it's just because it's an inert gas and it can flush out any like any debris or any residual you know cleaning fluids or lubricants or whatever just send it through and make sure that the everything is ready especially uh liquid oxygen if it comes in contact with just about anything organic it's just going to turn it into soup so i think that's why they just want to totally clear it out with nitrogen um from uh, Malone, thank you so much. Make a Venus ship. We will. We will. <laughs> um, another tip from Shannon. Thank you so much uh, about the sunset. I, I, yeah, I should have known better. <laughs> thank you. New membership from James. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. It's from Sky's the Limit. If Elon offered you a free seat on a future Crew Dragon, would you take it? And how is your dad doing? You had mentioned something a while back. Well, thank you, Sky's the Limit. Yeah, my dad's doing great. My dad ended up having emergency 
heart surgery. He has he has an artificial heart. He was born with a bicuspid heart valve. Healthiest person in the entire world bikes, you know, 20, 30, 40 miles a day, literally, like cycles. My mom and my dad ride tandem bicycles literally every day, um, quite religiously. Um, sorry, that's 30 to 60 kilometers or whatever, every single day. Um, and out of nowhere, his artificial heart valve was uh, infected. So he had to have it replaced really quickly from like thinking there's a problem to being under the knife within like a couple of days. So he's doing great. Um, if Elon offered me a ride on a dragon, if after like, I think after like 20 or 30 launches of dragon, I would consider it then once it's really been flight proven and really, really reliable. Um, I would consider it. It seems like a really safe, um, safe solution, honestly. Thank you. Bob Burrow. How's it going, Bob? Hi, Tim. Uh, what type of fuel does Electron use? Electron uses uh, RP1, so the same, and liquid oxygen, the exact same fuel as Falcon 9, Atlas V's booster stage, and Soyuz, uh, very common rocket rocket fuel. So, yep, RP1 is, is in the black tanks that you see kind of at the bottom half, and the liquid oxygen is in the white portion that is now ice, like we said. Um, so thank you from Bob and C-Dubs. How many launches are they planning a year? So uh, Rocket Lab is attempting to be able to do one launch every two weeks. So yeah, it would be almost 100. And they're licensed, I believe, for even 100 launches a year. That is their cadence that they're hoping to be able to reach. And I think now that they're ramping up production, they're going to be hopefully recovering boosters and reflying them and having three launch sites online. They're making the right steps to make that actually, uh, actually a possibility. So... Um, Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Ordered your Mars landing site tee. Super hyped to wear it. Well, thank you so much. Again, uh, thank. hopefully uh, you're being patient with our, our backlog of orders. We're trying really hard to catch up. Whoa, that was a beautiful bit of ice <laughs> getting thrown there. Um, let's see. Joseph, a huge shout out here to the Cal State Long Beach ME grads. I don't know what ME means, but... Congratulations, Long Beach ME grads, Middle Earth grads. <laughs> no, Middle Earth would be down in New Zealand. Uh, yeah, awesome, Joseph. And congrats to all the Cal State Long Beach mechanical engineering. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. It's too late, guys. I didn't even read your guys' things. Now it's all going to be, now for the next five minutes, we can all bask in mechanical engineering. <laughs> oh, I need sleep. Okay, Jay Walker, uh, would you consider doing presentations at colleges? I go to Emory Riddle in Arizona and would love to help set something up with our rocket development lab. I used to do public speaking, but honestly, for now, it's just I've got so many things I'm trying to do. Eventually, if I have a team where, you know, videos will, wouldn't halt and my entire, you know, YouTube presence wouldn't and completely die if I were to do public speaking, and it just is really inefficient use of time. Like it's, you know, takes basically three days or two days even to go fly to one speaking event. I did that for a little bit for photography stuff and it's just not, it's not easy and it's very exhausting. So maybe someday I'll do like a speaking tour or something like that eventually for like a week or something here and maybe like a week in Europe or something, but we will see, we will see. Um, from 2A, will Rocket Lab only catch the first stage during daylight hours? At first I'm sure yes, but eventually, I'm sure they could have some kind of lighting system and lighting solution along the the vehicle and the, the rope or something and, and lights and, and figure it out. I, I think. I have no idea, but maybe. Good question. Um, sorry, I'm just, again, trying to get through these really quick. How about launching from a, a Stratos helium balloon? We will be talking about that again in air launching and launching from altitude. So great question. <laughs> Pedro Becker, I'm not Peter Beck, but close. I love that. Thank you very much. New member from Christian Gruber. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, from Jose, this is good. In, in new industries, companies don't always need to be the best. They just need to be able to have the ability to be able to do so. Customers will come. That's exactly right. You don't always have to optimize to the absolute maximum of anything. Just good enough is good enough sometimes. Um, Clayton asks, what do I think about Space Force? I think Space Force was coming. Um, just like, you know, there used to not be an air force. It was run by the, by the army. I think it makes sense to have a military branch that, that is primarily concerned over space vehicles and space launch vehicles. I think it seems to make sense. Um, yeah. And it's been, it's been in the works. I mean, it's been talked about for decades. So it's, it, 
I'm glad to see it happen. I think it will help help um, streamline a lot of things in the future once it all kind of gets figured out. Because it, it was a mess when you're trying to do like a National Reconnaissance Office launching on a SpaceX private vehicle from the Air Force Base. Like it was just, it took, it traded hands like 10 times. So um, let's see here. Um, Arvind, why is SpaceX not flying Falcon Heavy regularly? Only three launches. There's just not a huge market for it. That's why when people say like, well, why don't they do this? They'll, they could get, you know, they could lift 10% more. Is there a market for payloads that are 10% heavier? Is there, you know, and that's kind of the thing with, with Falcon Heavy. Yes, there's some payloads that will need Falcon Heavy, but there's just not a lot out there. Um, the same with elect with Electron. Electron's doing really good about fulfilling the market that they see is is needed right now, which is, of course, um, you know, the small side industry. So could they launch heavier stuff? Sure they could. Is there a market for heavier stuff that, that they could be competitive in? I don't know. I don't know. Is it worth the investment to be able to make themselves competitive in those other markets and opening new markets? How much, where's the trade-off in there? So Rocket Lab is really focused on this. And maybe eventually if they run out of and they see a decline in their customers, they could branch out to other things. But for now, who knows? Um, Arrow, hello from Australia. Thank you so much. Um, Dexter Berry, thank you for your kind donation as well. Robert Hammond. Um, let's see here. Robert, uh, I tend to... Uh, it depends on what the thing is. That is not necessarily the best way to reach me. Um, it depends on, on what the matter is, but you can find, uh, my email guys, honestly, <laughs> I'm begging you, please don't email me with like questions about space flight and stuff. I, uh, Andrew are the guy that's <laughs> team member number one, basically for everyday astronaut. Andrew Taylor has seen my messages. It's like, I'm spending more time trying to answer emails and like Patreon messages and discord messages and text messages and, and calling different people than I am making videos these days. And that makes me really sad. So, um, yeah, if you feel like you need to reach out to me, just try on like on Twitter first. Oh, we'll be resuming the countdown and aiming for the last available slot in today's launch window of 632 UTC. The winds are still high, so we'll be watching them closely as we proceed through the countdown. Yes. So it just kind of depends on what it is, but, um, yeah, I, I appreciate the tip though, Robert. Okay. What, um, another one about Falcon heavy. Uh, what is the future of Falcon heavy given that SpaceX seems to be focusing on Starship? Well, um, SpaceX won't be selling any rides on Starship until it's proven. Meanwhile, they can sell rides on Falcon heavy. They, you know, they can sell that service because it is an available proven service. That's why they won contracts for Dragon XL with Falcon Heavy. Um, there is, I know a lot of people don't quite understand the value of having a reliable working rocket. Once a rocket's operational and proven, it's worth a lot more than any, you know, unflown rocket ever is. So, um, yeah, the future of Falcon Heavy is still, I'm sure they're still signing contracts. I, I'd be surprised if we ever saw more than like 30 launches, but, um, I wouldn't be surprised. I, yeah, but I I know we'll probably see more than like ten Falcon Heavy launches for sure, because they got to pay off that thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> thank you, Lorik. Talking about about foxes, I'm very interested now. I got to start learning about foxes, I guess. <laughs> Brandon, um, I'm in the U.S. and my girlfriend is in New Zealand. Going to be a tough two years if. They keep it closed. Wow. That would be really, really, really hard. I don't think they will. I think, you know, especially if we end up with a vaccine for coronavirus, I think that would uh, kind of solve most things. So hopefully, fingers crossed on good science. This is why science is so important, people. Getting out there and getting an education. Yeah. Um, from Night Fox, unfortunately, Night Fox doesn't have a fox. really wish I did. I did, however, take my profile picture myself at a free roaming zoo in uh, Miyagi Pre Prefecture. I don't know what that last word is, but that is awesome. That is a great picture. I've seen your picture a hundred times in, in the chat, so I did not know that was a picture you took. That's super cool. Thanks, Night Fox. Let's see. Um, are rockets always fully fueled regardless of Delta V requirements? Yes. I think the marginal cost of fuel 
is um, it's never worth not fully fueling it. I don't think there's ever been a thing where, I mean, Starhopper didn't fully fuel because it wouldn't have been able to lift itself if it's fully fueled. Starship's first flights, even just the Starship upper stage won't be fully fueled because again, won't have high enough thrust to lift itself off the pad. But I don't know of any orbital rockets where they intentionally like under fuel them. So um, yeah, that's a good question. I if anyone knows of a rocket that they underfuel intentionally based on payload and Delta V requirements, let me know. But I think they would rather have the extra margins just in case. Time today. Let's recap the payloads on board today's mission. Don't okay. stop me now. We've, we've kind of already gone over that a few times, so I wanted to keep trying to get to your guys' questions. Um, <laughs> baking cookies in St. Cloud. Come over. Oh, cookies sound phenomenal right now. I am big fan of cookies. Give me them cookies. Thank you, Olivia. Um, John Morris, thank you so much for your donation. You're awesome. Um, you should watch next electron launch with Elon. That would actually be really fun. Just I would love I would love to have Elon watch like a ULA or Electron launch. Um, and that or, or like have Tori Bruno watch a SpaceX launch, like sitting with them and getting their thoughts on it. I think that'd be a really cool way to see. Just kind of how their gears are turning through someone else's process. I think that'd be really cool. Um, we have a new membership from uh, Brendan. Thank you so much. Um, Alex Taylor, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. And thank you so much for your generous tip. Um, let's see here. Nicholas, wow. Thank Nicholas, thank you so much. That's really, really generous. Thank you. Um, Electron Heavy uh, makes sense if it's placing same load weights further in space, like around the moon for future colonies. But I would argue that it should have two electron engines around a larger core that's called nucleus and it's all named helium. That would be super cool. Now that I, now that I would agree with, but yeah, you know, again, it's all just about Delta V requirements, but, but parallel staging is not necessarily the best thing to do. Although it does, it does help offset some of the weight of the engines. There's definitely trade-offs in, in, in a configuration like that in a heavy, heavy configuration, but oftentimes it's the simplest solution is just to physically scale up the entire rocket. Um, yeah. Let's see from lucid. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, that's pretty great that you don't have any COVID cases that, that sounds pretty nice to be able to go back to work completely. Um, Bob, Electron is a partially small rocket. Is Rocket Lab planning on going bigger? Um, Bob, yeah, we've now mentioned that a couple times. They have no plans to go any bigger. Uh, Peter Beck, again, has really hammered in that they have a huge manifest already. They have plenty of customers coming for their services. And again, watch my interview with him where I'm sitting on the on the launch pad uh, that looks just like this. is the one actually in Wallops, though. Um, but he... You know, we basically say like, it's, is it worth the investment? Will that open up new opportunities? Will that open up more of a market for them? And how long would it take? How many launches of that new market and those new opportunities would it take to really pay off that investment? So that's the ultimate question. And for now, they have plenty of work to do and plenty of launches uh, to, to, and things to put into space. So, um, yeah. Um, from Kaushik says, superb channel, love the documentary style videos, the most informative channel on space out there. Great job and love the merch. Thank you so much. That is awesome. I really, really appreciate that. Um, let's see, why are DM2 solar panels are limited to 114 days? I don't, something about, they're wanting to make sure they're looking at the oxid, oxidization of them. Um, I don't remember why exactly. I will try to find that answer, but yeah. Guys, unfortunately, you guys are going to have to start slowing down on Super Chats <laughs> because I'm, as soon as this launch is either scrubbed or done, I'm going to bed. I am very tired. And I have to, tomorrow morning, I'll be recording uh, our, our Ludicrous Future. It's the podcast I do every week. If you guys are not subscribed to our Ludicrous Future, again, that is um, our, like me and you and us, um, our Ludicrous Future. Uh, we, I talk, I, I do a weekly space podcast where I, or I guess I'm talking about space. The other guys are talking about kind of futurism and EVs and all that type of stuff. So if you aren't watching that each week, and if you want more content from me, I do that every week. It comes out on Friday. Um, find it here on YouTube, our little future, or just pull up your phone right now and grab like your 
your podcast app. Um, because yeah, we do, um, we do that as well. So, um, yeah. So thank you guys for all your, this is, you guys are amazing, but I have to get up pretty early. Okay. Can you call your probe extraterrestrial Venusian research explorer from donations to awesome YouTubers? (laughs) Wait, 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 what? Can you call your, your probe extraterrestrial Venusian research explorer from donations to awesome YouTubers. Oh, every day. I see. Oh. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, Jonathan. I see what you did there. Oh, wow. Now, that is a backronym if I've ever seen one. I really like that idea. <laughs> We'd have to come up with something quite clever, I feel like. Um, pair character. Do- <laughs> this is one of those stickers. <laughs> I lo- I like the description better though. Pair character doing a shaka sign with his hand saying cool. <laughs> Thank you, Harshad. That's hilarious. Okay. Uh Bob, we hear a lot about full flow stage combustion. What is the combustion cycle of the Rutherford engine? The Rutherford engine is electric pump fed, so there's no um it's not a traditional cycle in that in that sense. The the Rutherford is its own electric cycle, so there's um, in a sense, it's closed. It's a closed cycle because there's no gas being expelled or no gas generator um, expelling, you know, gas through a turbine or anything. All the propellant runs through the pumps, as opposed to that doesn't. That's not always the case, uh, or at least, you know, not being dumped outside of a, a turbine. So it is its own cycle type. Is it just called, considered an electric fed engine, electric pump fed engine? So yeah, in a sense, it's it's a closed cycle, but it's um, it's not like other engines because it's electric so super cool again i do have videos all about i have multiple videos about electron and about rocket lab some of them are a little bit older but there's they still hold up minus the (laughs) spacesuit and some of the some of the graphics are of course a little older but yeah just click on i have a a playlist all about rocket lab basically all the different interviews with peter beck inside their uh their awesome facility if you're just joining us we have been in several holes this evening while we wait for winds to drop below acceptable levels for launch we currently have a little over six minutes until target liftoff time. Winds are still tracking high. Thank you for bearing with us today and spending your time with us. As we get closer to liftoff, I'll hand you over to Mission Control so you can hear operators proceed through the count. Cool. Hopefully, I have a feeling they're just trying for the end of the window and just a last minute attempt because it's not free to have all these people on console. You know, all the labor and all the fuel and all that stuff that, you know, all the time. So they're going to give it a try no matter what up to the window, but... At this point, you know, who knows that they're relying on the wind dying down to really be able to launch today. So unless the wind happens to die down here in the last five minutes, it'll likely be a scrub. So and I'm guessing the next opportunity will be in in 24 hours. But we'll we'll hear we'll hear more in in five minutes. Avionics flight mission. Flight avionics. Confirmed TVC battery charging is disabled. Confirmed. I mean, they're, they're pushing for flight, so. I think they're they're at the mercy of weather at this point, obviously. So, um, let's see. This is from Bubba Allen. Does the weight of the ice buildup affect the rocket? Yes, it is actually a consideration. You ha- you have to take it into consideration, but most of it falls off um, pretty quickly, and it um, the the vehicle gets really hot on ascent, but it doesn't all fall off, as you can tell by the Falcon Nine when it reenters. There's still a a pretty clear distinction between the portions that had ice and the portions that do not have ice. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely extra weight. Then that's really about all there is to it. So, yeah, good good question, Bubba. Um, thank you. Thanks for this shout-out here, Andy. Uh, if you guys want to join our awesome Discord channel or get access to exclusive live streams and our things like our exclusive subreddit too, you can go to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Um, yeah, and, and if you want to join our Discord uh, Andy had that there. So yeah, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. I really appreciate the patrons and I, I, yeah, you guys are awesome. Uh, I'm trying really hard to get caught up here before we sign off here. So really quick, I'm just going to kind of fly through these. Do I think SpaceX would ever consider make a four booster version? Absolutely not. They had way too hard of a time making Falcon heavy. And at this point they are so far, um, sunk cost fallacy, like get out of the Falcon program and into starship. They are all hands on starship going full blown starship um yeah they would they definitely would not be wanting to put any more money into the falcon 9 or falcon heavy than absolutely bare necessity bare necessity 
um, Devin Stark, maybe they'll start cleaning up all the spacecraft now. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that is something that, that Rocket Lab is really good about. They don't leave anything up in space. Their kick stage deorbits, the upper stage deorbits, um, everything everything in the Rocket Lab, they don't use any pyrotechnics. They use hydraulics and, and pushers and actuators. So they're, they're good tenants of space, period. <laughs> um, let's see here. From Professor Wald, Walden, waking up to Tim streaming a rocket launch on my birthday. Even if it's scrubbed, today's going to be a good day. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Professor Waldon. Hold on. Go ahead. Please confirm flight computer as goes agreeing. Confirm. And VMS, please lock auto sequence and confirm. Confirmed. They're going for it. But everyone say real quick, happy birthday to Professor Walden. That's awesome. Thanks for joining on, on your birthday. When we get down here closer to two minutes, we will listen fully in. But like I said, I'm trying to keep up here. So, um, Evan, so were you tearing up at the Demo 2 launch video on liftoff or was it rocket down watch getting to you from three miles away? I was definitely tearing up. You know, to be honest, at liftoff and stuff, it was more like the excitement that it, it actually happened. It didn't really hit me until about 30 seconds or so that that it what's happening. Like it kind of all started catching up to me. And yeah, then, I'll, you know, we had a little some something splashed on my eye a little bit, you know. Um, okay, so I'm listening Any here, but Kenneth, there we go. That is right there. If you guys want to uh, subscribe to Our Ludicrous Future, do it right here on YouTube or on our podcast. Thanks for the shout out there, Kenneth. Uh, it's, I love doing it. For me, it's like it's just fun to be able to talk to my friends each week about space and get them all caught up on all the cool stuff going on. So thank you, Kenneth. Okay. Um, Boof, I saw a proposal to use Starship to send a small satellite to rendezvous with an interstellar object like um, Oumuamua back in 2017. Any thoughts on this? Absolutely. I mean, Starship is a very capable vehicle. It would need its yeah its own kick stage um, to be able to really do anything interplanetary because it just doesn't make sense to, to send a full Starship um, interplanetary or a stripped-down version of Starship, kind of like what we're seeing with the lunar Starship. But yeah, I, I think that would absolutely be possible. There's a lot of power in that thing. So yeah. let's listen in here for the last please minute. Disable anti geysering and confirm. Anti geysering disabled. Stage one, please confirm. Stage one, tanks are pressed. Stage one is pressed. Stage two, same to you. Stage two is pressed. Hold, hold, hold. Ground Dang. wind exceeds. Yep. Okay. There we go, guys. It's, it's scrub for the day. I'm still going to be listening in to see when they're going to the next attempt i'm guessing it's in 24 hours i don't think i heard yet though but hold 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 means they are done that is not launching today it is not launching today so yep the ground winds uh did it for us today so hopefully they get another attempt tomorrow so i'm going to try and catch up with you guys' comments here really quick and see if we get a, a time when they're going to be doing this too so um from brendan how much more money to say that josh <laughs> hey none i think that is rude Brendan, you should be nicer to Josh. Because represent. Uh, R. Hopper, love your show. Strong back is rising. Yeah, now it's too late. But thank you so much, R. Hopper. Um, whoa, uh, my friend literally had that surgery today. Oh. Glenn, the team has made the decision to stand down today due to high winds. We still have several days remaining in the launch window, so we hope to see you next time. Information on the next launch opportunity and webcast details will be shared on our website and social media feeds. Thanks for tuning in to today's launch attempt, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. All right, so we don't have a thing yet, but we'll stay tuned on Twitter. I will keep you guys up to date on Twitter as well. If you guys don't follow me on Twitter, what are you doing? Uh, just search Everyday Astronaut, even though the actual name is Erday Astronaut, which is not my fault. I am so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so let's see here. I also need to hide this. But let me let me finish up your guys' things quick, and then I'll go to bed. Um, so Isaac, that's crazy. Your friend just, I'm assuming, heart surgery. Uh, they'll they'll do great today. That's such a uh, it's so amazing to see doctors be able to just like knock that out of the park like it's nothing. So best of luck to your friend with surgery. Um, yeah. Um, what is the weight of the payload in this? We do not know the actual weight of this exact mission because uh, of the classified nature of some of the of the NRO pay payload, but it could be up to 225 kilograms or about 500 pounds or whatever. Uh, let's see. Um, from from Thick One, hi, Tim. I'm about 230 kilometers away from Mahia, and I can see it at night. I have my camera equipment set up 
to get photos of it. That's super cool. Hopefully the next time it's it's an option. Yeah, isn't it amazing that you can see rockets from so far away because they get so high and then you eventually lose them over the horizon. But I mean, it's crazy that even on the west coast of Florida, you can see a rocket launching on the east coast. Super cool stuff. So hopefully you get a good shot of it on the next attempt. Um, could you explain a bit about how susceptible are rockets to winds? Each rocket depends on a lot of variables, a lot, like their fineness ratio. In other words, how long to how skinny they are. Um, like the Falcon 9 is very susceptible to upper level winds because upper level winds can be going really strong in one direction. And then literally like a, you know, a kilometer later going a completely different direction. And when you're traveling at a thousand kilometers an hour, um, you can basically hit like a sledgehammer going between those layers. So um, there's definitely certain considerations. That's one of those things that Starship is supposed to be better about because uh, it's bigger, more robust, things like that. It is just not as affected as easily. But each rocket just has certain limits, and they have to know those limits in the engineering, and they have to watch the weather accordingly. So that's about all I know about it. Um, I got a small crowd around my phone watching it work at the old Intel factory. Tonight. That's awesome. Hello to everyone at Intel. I'm uh, using a computer that has your processor right now. So thanks. That's awesome. Thanks for saying hi. Um, and good luck making, making computer chips. Super cool. Um, the real dust cake. Um, as a Rutherford engine is 3D printed, I think they flush the chamber with nitrogen so that any material or powder dust is spitted out. Makes the most sense for me. Well, I'd hope that before they get it to the launch pad, they have cleaned it, you know, and got rid of all the extra metal shavings. Because they even do static fires of their vehicles and stuff. I'm pretty sure they purge it because of any other, uh, anything, everything, they purge it, period. Um, <laughs> from James, <laughs> this chat is ridiculous now. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Loric, they run cryo through the engine to chill the pumps and other components to make sure that they don't shock cool the components at engine start. Oh, the nitrogen is, is it liquid nitrogen? And it's, that's what they actually cool it with? I know... The Falcon 9, according to what I read when I was doing the, the timeline video, they actually run liquid oxygen through the chambers and through the through the lines, which confuses me. I, liquid nitrogen would make a lot of sense. That would make a lot of sense. Hmm. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, where did it go? Where did it go? Hang on, hang on. From Matt. Oh, God. <laughs> revert to a vehicle assembly. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Uh, Matt's aw an awesome YouTuber. I never say his last name right. I don't ever remember if it's Lown or Lone. That's one of those things that I'm like horrible at. Same with Jack Byer. I don't remember if it's Byer or Bear. My brain just can't tell. So sorry, Matt, but I love you and I love your videos. And Matt has some of the best Kerbal videos out there. So hi, Matt. Happy, happy Thursday over there in, uh, in the UK. Hope you're doing well. Um, Rocket Chaser. Um, Tim, thanks for all your hard work. You're the best. Staying awake in Maryland. Uh, have you closed on your house? Where is it? I closed on a house on Monday in in, uh, in Cedar Falls, Iowa. So, yeah, I'm really excited. And it, uh, it's going to be great. I'm going to be hooked back up to 10 gig internet. La. How great is that going to be that I'll have, uh, yeah, 10 gig? That's just insane. So, really excited. Thank, uh, so excited for Cedar Falls Utilities best utility company ever <laughs> from Mizuno Mark. Thank you so much. You're doing it. You're doing it all. My friend, you're doing it all. Um, greetings from Sri Lanka from uh, Sheehan. Thank you so much. Um, oh, someone from Mahia, even Tim C. Thank you. That is awesome. Congrats on being in a gorgeous place on earth. Um, from, uh, Kof Manowitz, do you see more rocket startups coming about or is it too cost prohibitive? I think there's still room for a few more, especially some unique ideas, um, but it's competitive and it has a lot of R&D costs, a lot of upfront costs that are very cost prohibitive, but I, I, I could imagine that there's still going to be a few more popping up here in the next couple of years, but unfortunately it seems like about every year, five new ones go online and about every year we lose about five you know, or going online, uh, trying to like do something and we lose about five of those every year too. So it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's very, very hard. Um, what's my opinion on the Australian space agency and its future? Uh, 
to be honest, I don't really know. I think it's all about how much funding they can do and, and what they can do with that funding. But I think it's awesome. I think any any country with a space agency is like, that's awesome. How great is that? Um, but yeah, it just all depends on what their budget, what the public wants their space program to do and, and what they can do with that budget. If, if it's building hardware, if it's training astronauts, if it's flying astronauts, I mean, super cool. I, I think that's great. I think that's great for everybody. Um, does dehydrated pineapple belong on space pizza? Oh, Eric, don't even get me, don't even get me started on this. Not now. Don't even get me started. It's 140. No time to talk pineapples on pizza. Mark, hello from Porto, uh, a leg from, from Brazil. <laughs> Thanks for saying hi, Mark. You're awesome. Um, good morning from Denmark. Thank you so much. I'm excited to go to bed and have good morning soon too. <laughs> um, hello from Canada. Thank you so much. Um, let's see here. Do we have any idea, any idea of the first launch from Wallops? I'm only two hours away, so I'd love to head over for the first one. Uh, I don't remember. D Discord, do you guys know where we're at there with that? I, I don't remember what exactly it is. Um, um, Ginger, Ginger Man 512, I have no idea if it's 10 gig wave or 10 gig gpon i don't know it's there's fiber ran to the house and then it's 10 gig i don't know <laughs> i'm really excited for it though um let's see uh brief uh fixtures in japan oh it's like a state or uh, or a county that's cool that's awesome thank you uh ehud for the for the knowledge thank you so much from um Em empirical that really is very nice of you thank you so much um if you if i were given an opportunity to go to space with any of the private space companies which one would it be and why well right now if i were to get on a vehicle um at least in the next like two years two three years or something i think the one that i would have no no hesitation to really get on would be the new shepherd actually from blue origin because it's just like 20 minutes it'd be really pretty it seems like a very simple safe vehicle they've had awesome luck with it they've tested it to the gills i mean that thing just seems like it's it'd be a really uh fairly low risk and and safe simple easy ride um next would would definitely be dragon but it's definitely a lot more power and going to orbit i wouldn't want to be gone for like a long time i just don't think i'd do too well up there but yeah i would i would i would ride dragon again after like 20 or 30 flights of dragon and once it's all proven out to be safe i'd consider going then so um, <laughs> if all the current land jelly side up, what do you think of skilled engineers will be able to do? Wait, what? <laughs> if all of the current plans land, oh, jelly side up, when do you think skilled engineers will be able to get jobs off planet? Um, mm, I honestly, <laughs> I see what you're saying now, Lucas. Jeez, that took me way too many times to comprehend. I have no idea. Um, I think they're... There could be potential for off-planet jobs, I think, in 15 years or so. Um, like, legitimately, 15 to 20 years. Yeah, which is pretty exciting. Um, how do companies get permission to launch rockets? There's FAA filings. There's FCC filings, often for the radios. There's uh, a lot of... Uh, yeah, it's mostly um, FAA flight, flight licenses. But, yeah, I think. I, that's something I, I don't know a ton about, though. Um, <laughs> thank you from NNNN. That's awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> if a country was aboard a, on a program to Mars, how much do you think it would cost? Um, I will stream Starlink. I think it got pushed to Saturday. Um, but how much... Wait. If a country... Sorry, I'm still kind of confused. If a country was aboard a program to Mars... Uh, so, I mean, I, have, I, I, don't, I don't have any idea. I have no idea how much Mars will end up costing. If Starship works out as planned, that trip could be as cheap as, you know, some of the early ones might still be, you know, hundreds of millions if SpaceX wants to mark up the price since it's a service only they can do. But I think pretty quickly it could get down, you know, if Starship's working out fully reusable, the tanker stuff, all that stuff's working, I think they could get it down to a million to Mars-ish per person. Um, and eventually Elon wants to get it down to $250,000. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, from Canada, I love that. Um, any new tracks? I have like literally probably twenty new songs. 
that I just haven't like released and I need to master and mix and I just need to hire someone to do a better job than I can do. Cause that would be awesome. So, um, thank you, Seth. That really means a lot. Um, why don't I apply to be an astronaut program or mission command career? I'm already living my dream job. Like this is literally my dream job. I, I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to really go to space. I, at least I didn't want to, I'm starting to want to a little more now ish that it's actually happening. Um, but not, not that I'm like actually going to space and that don't read into that at all. Um, just now that like humans are flying on commercial rockets and you were seeing all these commercial options pop up. It's like, hmm, this is actually a thing that people can do. Um, but I really, I don't really have, yeah, I really don't have any, um, desire to, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm living my, doing my dream job right now. So, um, yeah, thank you though. Um, and Luke, thank you so much. And lastly, from Chad, finally giving me permission to go to bed. And I think it's time. <laughs> thank you guys so much for hanging out with me tonight. Hopefully they will reset here very soon. And um, yeah, I, uh, we'll see. I, uh, hopefully they don't overlap between Starlink and Rocket Lab launching within the same window. I will be so tired because I think... Starlink is a very early launch. This is a very late launch. I might just not sleep whenever that is. So we'll see. Hopefully we'll see you guys here whenever that is. And I just really appreciate you guys hanging out and asking great questions. Um, stick around. Like I said, it's going to be a little bit of time before you guys see any probably produced content from me. Um, although I might be able to slip something out between taxes and moving and all that stuff. I might be able to squeeze out the next one. But We'll see, unfortunately though, but just go through my old catalog. There's still so many videos you probably haven't seen. So, uh, and meanwhile, there'll definitely be some live streams. So thank you guys so much. That's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to earth for everyday people. Good night, everybody, or good morning, or goodbye. <laughs> see you guys.